Hi everyone, um, welcome to what I believe is lecture 12 of the BDC Digital Academy. I hope everyone's been enjoying the lecture so far and they've helped out in the confusions and the problems you had in relation to debate. Um, what we will be talking about today is the legitimacy of democracy. It's one of my particularly favorite topics and I feel like it's important to understand the ideas that we will talk about today to navigate your way around uh, politics motions or in particular motions about democracy. Before we begin, just a few introductions and clarifications. Uh, my name is Sajid. I am a fourth year student at IBA at the University of Dhaka. I study finance, but I have a knack for political philosophy, as you can guess. Um, the second thing is, I understand that this lecture is going to be public and can be viewed across the world. Um, however, this academy, I believe, is made for the purpose of helping the Bangladeshi debating community in particular which means if I speak in English for the entirety of the lecture, however long it may be, it may not be the most effective or the most suitable for the Banshee debating community in particular, for which reason I will code switch into Bangla at particular points in this lecture. Um, so to any friends watching from across the world, I'm really sorry. Um, you can obviously watch the rest of the lecture. Um, as for my debating experience, I've been debating for, I think, about seven to eight years. I started. Um, like the entirety of my debating career has been in Bangladesh. I've been exposed to uh, the Asian circuit at large and in some cases the other parts of the world as well through the World Championship. Um, I've debated about for about three to four years in school and for the last three and a half years in university. So a lot of the things I talk about in this lecture um, will be based on things I've read or things I've heard other people talk about or things I've been exposed to over the course of the last seven to eight years. Um, just one thing before we begin, it's just that if there is something that you disagree with in this lecture, um, please bear in mind that I'm no, like, I'm no endorsed expert in this particular field. I might be wrong. Um, and also a lot of these are opinion-based uh, ideas. They may not necessarily be truistic facts, but rather normative opinions, which basically means my opinion on how things are and how things should be. Um, which basically means that if you do disagree with me, uh, feel free to comment um, on the video or reach out to me. I'll try to get back to you and answer any questions you also may have um, in the best way I can. Okay. Um, and also, I need to free marketing. Uh, if you like this lecture, please consider joining uh, Next Level Debating. Uh, it's an online venture that me and a friend of mine, Adi, we run, where we try to um, teach relatively not basic debate skills and try to take people who've barely started debating or been exposed to the debating to the next level, as the brand itself suggests. So we have a Facebook page. Please consider going there and checking us out. Yeah. So the caveat. Um, the content for such a class is obviously endless. There's like a million things you can talk about when it comes to democracy and politics. What we will try to do in this lecture is we'll try to summarize and simplify the useful concept. So. Although I will refer to a lot of uh, moral philosophers or important people at times, um, almost everything I say can be referenced. I just will avoid that because I don't think that's particularly useful in debates to know like a bunch of names of old people who talked about really fancy things. And obviously I won't go into like super micro details of everything. I'll try to summarize to the extent that it helps you understand the issue well enough for you to use in debates. Um, the focus of this lecture will not be, it's it's twofold. I think the first is it, it won't aim to teach you arguments directly. It will try to create a thought process for you by triggering questions in your head. And the flow with which we organize this lecture, as you will soon see, is by answering a series of questions as they develop. So what I want to aim to create from this lecture is basically to create a thought process within you that can encourage you to ask further questions yourself and read up on specific information and ideas. The second uh, focus, I didn't write it down, but the second focus is we won't focus too much on um, practical stuff as much as we will on normative philosophical stuff. So um, a lot of the things we talk about will be in abstract and will be how things should be rather than ground realities or nitty gritty case studies of every country and how they are, right? Um, we will take a more generic philosophical approach to dealing with issues. 
Um, if you want additional material about this, there's a great lecture by Ashish Kumar on YouTube, which I recommend. It's not just for democracy, it's for principal arguments in general. Um, you can feel free to look into it. It has some really great content. Um, I think Jason Zhao also has made a pretty decent lecture recently. Um, I haven't seen the entire lecture, unfortunately, but uh, I saw bits and pieces of it and it seemed quite excellent. Um, he's a world champion, so you guys can consider looking into that as well. Fine. So. Amra first Jetani and Kothavulbo, Shirochi will try to understand the moral evolution of the state. So to understand the moral evolution of the state, the first thing we need to understand is what is the most fundamental aspect of being human? What makes us human? And I think a very common argument uh, or a very common understanding of what is most fundamental about being human is autonomy or the ability to choose or the ability to make choices with rational thought. There are some really standard ways of proving this in debates. The first is um, autonomy is the premise of all value, which means if you think about it, everything we value in this world is based on us choosing to value it. There's no other reason. So for example, I'm wearing this red t-shirt right now. It has value to me because I choose to give it value. If this thing was a million dollars, it would probably have the same value to me because I choose to wear it and I choose to protect myself from a particular, say, sun. I don't know. I, I, it's not even for protection. It's just for comfort, right? We wear it for comfort. Um, let's say that there's a diamond necklace that uh, has a lot of value for a woman. I probably won't see a lot of value in that diamond necklace because I choose to not value it as an important ornament that I should own. So if you really think about it, everything that has value in this world, whether it's the food we like, it has value because we like it and we are willing to pay a certain amount of money for it. So the value in things often doesn't come from our understanding of what the price of the product is because, you know, a lungi could be really expensive but not valuable to a woman. But it's based on the idea that we choose to give it value. So since every good thing about this world has value and choice is the premise of all value, Choice has to be more important than any valuable thing in the world, and therefore choice or autonomy has to be the most valuable. So the fact that we should be able to make choices is the most fundamental power we have because with that power, we create any and all value in this world. That's one proof. The second proof for this is the ability to have autonomy is what separates us from animalistic traits such as pleasure and pain. So at the animal, let's say a tiger sees his prey in front of him, he will not think twice about what it means to kill this animal. He will just go for it, eat it, purely based on the pleasure that is derived out of that action. He will avoid certain things or they will avoid certain things, it will, it will avoid certain things, um, based on the fact that it can lead to pain that is created for this individual or for this tiger. But if you really think about it, humans don't operate in that way. We can choose to often do things that are painful for this greater concept that we ourselves choose to create. So for example, we often go to war to defend our nation. Probably has more pain than pleasure for us, but we choose to do it because we choose. <laughs> That's the point, we choose. Um, we often avoid a lot of pleasures because we think it's the morally correct thing to do. So a lot of people go vegan and don't kill animals for food. Um, a lot of people avoid a lot of choices because they believe that it shouldn't be the morally correct thing to do. So for example, a lot of people avoid alcohol, a lot of people avoid marijuana. So we can choose to not engage in pleasure or not be afraid of pain because we choose. And because there's a moral framework that has been created within our head, we have intelligence, we have this weird idea of morality within our hearts that separates humans from all other beings. And therefore, autonomy and the ability to choose is probably the most fundamental part of being human. In analysis, extensive there are some standard debate analogies to prove this as well. So you can use the example of slavery, which is basically saying that the reason why we all believe slavery is immoral, even if we give this person a lot of rights, a lot of money and keep him very happy, is because we take away choice from that person. We take away autonomy 
from that person to decide how this person wants to live. The harmless rape, it's actually a popular analogy that Ashkal Mane debate ami dekse on news kore. I think Ashish Kumar popularized it. Is uh, it's basically an, an, anal an analogy that says that say a woman is lying unconscious on the ground and there's a man. This man has the ability to rape her. Okay. Let's say that he rapes this woman, and for the sake of argument, as soon as he rapes her, he dies, which means he cannot rape any other person ever again. This woman wakes up, doesn't recall this ever happening, doesn't have physical remarks, doesn't have any trait or any harm to her that makes her remember that that incident happened and no one else in the world finds out about it. If we were only looking at value or only looking at good consequences or utility, we probably should allow this action, right? Because there's no harm that happens to the woman in reality and there's pleasure that is created for the man. But intuitively, would you allow this? No, you wouldn't. Because there's something about the concept of rape that is super disgusting. And we can't exactly pinpoint the reason why, but it is quite disgusting. And if you really think about what the possible logic could be, it is the fact that this man has violated the woman's autonomy. The woman never chose for this man to have a physical interaction with her. And he yet, despite that situation, the man went ahead and did it. So the reason why we feel so disgusted about violating the rights of this woman is because we violated the right to autonomy more than anything else. So all of the things that I've just talked about basically tell you that autonomy should never be violated. Right? Obviously, this is not entirely true. There are three or four responses that you, you, know, you can make to these arguments. I don't want to get into that because it'll ruin our thought process. Um, if someone wants those responses, I'll be happy to reach out to this individual and talk. It's a deep philosophical discussion. Um, but for the sake of argument, these are the ways in which, if you really think about it, autonomy is the most fundamental aspect of being human. And the next question is, what exactly is a state? A state is an entity that exercises power or coerces you when you are a part of that state. And it probably exercises more power and more coercion than any other entity in the world. So if you think about it, the state can control everything that you do by passing laws. If this law says that you can't do something, if you do it, they have the right to punish you in any way and form they want. So a level of power, a level of coercive, like absolute ruthless power, kono entity nai as much as the state has. Maybe Allah has it, but for the sake of argument, we can't scientifically prove his existence for this. Um, tahole, how exactly are laws morally legitimate? Because if you think about it, asking individuals to follow laws is akin to giving up autonomy. If I am forced to do something that I don't want to, I am doing something that I never chose. By definition, that is taking away autonomy from me. And by definition, that means laws are morally illegitimate. There's a distinction that I want to create. The distinction is, does this mean that human beings should never follow laws or will never follow laws? No, that's not the argument that I'm trying to make. A lot of times, human beings do follow laws because maybe that's a great thing to do. Shabai law follow korle a collective benefit hoy. And jehetu collective benefit hoy, ami nije tike choose korte si law follow korte for utilitarian purposes, right? But that does not make the laws morally legitimate because the premise on which laws are based on is violating autonomy of individuals. So philosophers tried to find a solution to this problem. And they said the solution to this problem is democracy. Democracy means that the state in question should be elected by the people it has power over. And the reason is coercive power over people 
can only be justified if people choose to give that power, right? So all other forms of governments, autocracies, military dictatorships, um, theocracies, religious dictatorships, technocracies, dictatorships by specialists or you know scientists and you know technocrats, basically specialists. All of these are immoral because they don't give people the ability to choose who they give up their autonomy to. Democracy is the only kind of government that allows people that option. And the only justification for the coercive power of the state is through people giving them that power through their autonomy. So that is the pro solution that philosophers created. In theory, this sounds great, but there are a million problems with this solution. Firstly, what kind of democracy do we want? Because democracy is just a word. We have to organize a system to make this entire process fair. So the first suggestion was to create a unanimous direct democracy. Unanimous direct democracy mane hoche, two words, direct. Direct mane hoche, protecta issue te manusher opinion nibo. Kono ekta issues like economics, health, protecta policy, foreign policy, shop kisu te manusher opinion nibo. And it has to be unanimous because shobai judi eteke vote na kore, ar ami tau law ta pass kori, the moment one person says no, and I'm still passing the law, that makes the law illegitimate for that one person. So the logic behind this is, we should not violate anyone's consent when passing policies that apply to all. We should always protect consent in such situations. There are two problems that you can very clearly see with unanimous direct democracy. This is very obvious. The first is, Shabar opinion shop kisu the kem ni ni ba. Miki prottek din pachta gori election korbo. Shabai yeh se vote dao. Amar aaj ke discussion, amar aaj ke hoy discussion. Seems unrealistic. The second is, people are likely to have conflicting interests all the time. You will have disagreements where you definitely um, have disagreements with each other about different things you want from life. It's unlikely that every single individual within a nation will want the same things. And jokhon e deadlock and mane disagreement gulo hobe. You just won't pass policies. So it's a very unrealistic world that a unanimous direct democracy, although principally it makes sense, it doesn't seem practically feasible to implement in this world. So philosophers um, try to find ways to make it successful, um, but eventually it wasn't really successful in most cases. But Tao, if you really think about places where it could be successful, there are two situations. Number one, and, and both of these are sort of abstract. Number one is a community all absorbed on an ideal. So they all believe in a particular ideology or a particular belief. This could be religion, this could be secular. It just means that this community is very tightly knit and the entire community wants the same thing. So presumably these states have to be very small they have to be very tightly knit, and everyone within that community has to have that sense of belonging to this identity. So an example could be utopian communities such as Israeli kibbutzim, which basically is an Israeli agrarian community. You can read about them. Or just very tightly knit religious communities that don't violate consent or aren't oppressive, something along those lines. The other group that, in theory, um, should be OK with like or where this could be feasible is a group of rational, self-interested individuals. So what this basically says is, since everyone is rational and self-interested, everyone will look at ways to work together in order to maximize benefits to everyone. No one will want to disagree when they realize the disagree will lead to a deadlock, and the deadlock and inability to pass policies is going to harm everyone. So this is the principle used in a complete market-based capitalist economy or laissez-faire economy. Um, I hope at the capitalism lecture Ashbe, BDC, BDC Digital Academy um, in the near future. I think uh, Tosib is taking a lecture on economics very soon. Um, so okay, you'll see a lot about this maybe. But basically these are two ideas that in theory, um, in small groups of places uh, or in small communities that are all absorbed into an ideal, or a group of rational self-interested individuals, these are people that are likely to want to work together and are unlikely to disagree as much. But both of these apply in theory. 
The next solution is majoritarian representative democracy. Majoritarian representative democracy is the kind of democracy we see in most countries across the world. So majoritarian basically means that you don't need unanimous votes. Shobar vote lagbena. Majority has to decide. So 51% of votes win. And representative democracy basically says that you shouldn't have elections every day because it's, un, like, it's not necessarily very feasible. We can have representatives to act on your behalf. So these are the members of parliaments that we elect based on electoral cycles. The logic is that since everyone gets to express their opinion to some extent, it is not outright violation of consent. And satisfying the majority still is more fair than deciding to you know, satisfy minorities or a random choice or a random money, randomly doing something. Because at least majority means maximum manush kushi thakbe. So, although it's not principally as perfect as the money, unanimous direct democracy, it's still realistically the best solution based on philosophy. But there are many problems with majoritarian representative democracy. Number one. Minorities, which is the 49% of people, always have to give up autonomy and be coerced with no moral legitimacy. So if you think about it, even if I don't vote for a particular politician, say America, you're a Democrat right now who never voted for Trump, the Trump administration's policies are still things that are affecting your life and laws that you have to live by. So the fact that you never consented to these laws and are still suffering from their consequences is sort of like violating your consent and it's basically oppressing you. And therefore, this government, which has majority and representation, can still not be morally legitimate. So a question that has been there in philosophy for quite some time, and the, the one solution that most individuals or most major philosophers try to piggyback on is the idea of the social contract. Okay, It's a very deep philosophical thought with a lot of debates. You can look into it. Um, Rousseau, I think, coined the term and Hobbes did a lot of work on it. These are French Revolution philosophers. Um, but the idea of the social contract basically says that you and your state have an implicit contract, both the state and the individual, where because the state is taking away your consent, it can justify it by giving you things in return. So it gives you welfare, it gives you identity, it gives you social security, it gives you protection, it gives you public goods like roads, and you know it creates economic well-being for you to engage in, uh, education systems for you to learn from. So it's like a give and take relationship that you have implicitly signed the contract in because you take benefits from the state without realizing. And therefore, um, the fact that you give up consent for it, even if imperfect, is fair something along those lines. There are two problems with this defense. Uh, number one, no one actually signed a contract because I'm often born into countries that I never chose, right? So imagine what it's like being a Muslim living in India. Uh, they never decided what their version of national identity is, but for some reason it's assumed they signed a contract with India. So it's a bit strange. The second is, even if I sign this contract, I'm still giving up autonomy by signing. And this is kind of immoral. This is one of the reasons why um, slave contracts, even if those contracts are things I can sign into, I don't allow. Slave contracts are immoral even if I choose to sign them. This is because it takes away, the moment I sign the contract, I am less of a human. And I lose human dignity by giving up my autonomy at that point in time. So giving up autonomy, even if done with autonomy, is immoral. And that's another response to the social contract idea that basically says that, you know, I wouldn't want to give up autonomy even if I chose to initially. And that's immoral and that's why we ban slave contracts. That's the first problem with majoritarian representative democracy, which is the 49% are forced to follow rules and regulations that they never decided and are coerced into. The second is, and this is really interesting, equality of voting power really doesn't exist, right? Um, the reason is, it's assumed, 100% of people are voting, 
we respect the wishes of the 51% and not the 49% and we are always satisfying the majority. This isn't true. Imagine, say, take this example, okay? Um, I hope you guys understand what the word constituency means. Constituency is that Bangladesh is an election, hoi, ward, ward is um, that MP is an MP, Tapos, right? So, Dhanmundi te, we vote for Tapos rather than anyone else. In another constituency, you vote for someone else. And then these individuals become members of parliament or mayors or depending on what the political process is at that point in time. So you vote for your constituency. So a example ta, uh, so say constituency A, I mean, Dhanmundi. A Dhanmundi act a seat as a parliament. And Dhanmundi the population as a dusho manusha. Constituency B also has one seat in parliament and has a population of 150, right? Do it a representative into parliament equal power because act a seat. Kintu, if you really think about it, act a manush within constituency A or relative voting power ki 1 by 200, can do isho manusha mudhe o act jo. So or voter power hoche 1 by 200. Constituency B te act a manusha voting power hoche 1 by 150. So that basically means if you are a voter in constituency B, you are more powerful than a voter in constituency A. So this idea that majoritarian democracy with representation is fair is based on the idea that often these constituencies are divided to give everyone equal voting power, but in reality that's not the case. Constituencies are imperfect. The third is, even if equality of voting power exists, equality of voting power is just a bad system. Um, imagine what it's like for an LGBT person living in Bangladesh, okay? Majoritarian democracies give everyone equal voting power in theory. Let's assume that's true. That means if we are to vote on whether to legalize LGBTQ marriage, I have the same voting power as someone from the LGBTQ community. That also basically means that I might care about this individual to, or this issue to say, if we were to quantify how much I care about it, I may care about it 10%, huh? because maybe I'm a Muslim, maybe I don't like the fact that LGBTQ marriage is not allowed in Islam and therefore um, maybe I will abstain from my vote or maybe my conservative family members or maybe conservative friends I have will vote against it. But an LGBT person living within Bangladesh will vote for it and this person probably cares about this issue to 90% or 95% because it's a very fundamental issue in their lives. Whether or not they can get married to the person they love, whether they can experience the sexual rights or the rights of identity that shape who they are. So. Even if democracy ensures equal power for all individuals, that's a bad thing because that makes it seem like everyone should have equal power despite caring about this issue to various degrees. Um, this is an argument that Dan Lahav used in around at HWS. I forgot which round, but it was a very powerful argument to explain why. Democracy is an imperfect system in principle because everyone should not have equal voting power for all issues. So I just want to talk about two thought experiments before ending this section of the lecture. The first, uh, both uh, thought experiments are suggested by this moral philosopher named Robert Paul Wolf. He's a political scientist, you can search him up. The first is the democratic lottery. So basically what he says is, um, Imagine a situation where we collect everyone's vote and after collecting everyone's vote, say there are 100 people, 51 people vote for one politician, 49 people vote for another politician. The current system, he suggests, is not an equality of chance, but rather a tyranny of the majority. And he refers to the work of John Stuart Mill. He basically says that Bangladesh, which Bangladesh is a bad example. In India, the Muslims will never gain power. It will always be a Hindu majority that controls what laws are created and what laws 
are going to exist going into the future. So even if I give tokenistic voting power, none of this power matters because Muslims will never get majority coalition and they're always likely to be on the losing side, especially in an increasingly hostile environment. What this theory suggests, or this thought experiment suggests is, Amra actually vote collect or poor. If there are 51 votes for one side and 49 for another side, we should have a lottery and randomly pick which side to elect. Why is this fair even then? It's fair because probability still is higher on the 51% because the side that is more likely to win is the 51 by 100 side. Probability is less on the minority chance because it's 49 by 100. But this method at least gives the minorities some ability to get elected rather than no ability to get elected based on a system that is a tyranny of the majority. And he refers to alternative situations in which we use um, morality of luck or chance to decide. Um, so he refers to examples like army drafts. Army drafts say, we have large supplies of soldiers, but all of these soldiers are all equally capable of fighting the war. So the best way to decide is by luck. Randomly draft people through lottery to decide who should go to war. And the reason why all of these people should have the equal chance, even in elections, is because everyone that gets a certain number of votes, say 51 or 49, is morally somewhat justifiable as a ruling party. Era to kewi objectively kharap na, because objectively kharap hoile, 51% vote peto na, but 49% vote peto na. Ekanakta subjective choice ase bole, amra election kochi, and different people have different opinions. So since it is subjective, everyone is subjectively morally acceptable, we should just leave it to chance. Um, so think about this thought experiment, think about what this means. Um, and try to, maybe this is a motion idea going into the future, I'm not sure. Um, you could think about it in general um, and why this is a better system than the system we currently have. The other is, uh, the other thought experiment Robert Paul Wolf suggests is this thought experiment of the instant direct democracy. So what the instant direct democracy basically suggests is that we have a lot of technology, we have a lot of easy access to information and easy ability to transfer information. And what he suggests is, let's just connect an opinion recording machine to every TV in every house. Huh? This will be cheaply accessible technology. Jodi gorib basha TV na thake, shorkar a subsidy the TV pathabe. Shobar basha ekta TV thakbe, egani kono ekta interactive um, ekta machine thakbe, jekhane opinions collect hobe, just like the internet. Protect din ekta interactive TV show hobe, jekhane specialist ra thakbe, mandated analysis thakbe. Shobar uh, different opinions amra nibo, counter narratives nibo, bubble le rakbo na shobai ke. And at the end of every issue, we will take a na nationwide opinion on what should happen in this issue by allowing people to vote. This is a way of establishing a version of the unanimous direct democracy, but basically calling it instant direct democracy, even if not unanimous, instantly since we're informing people about a lot of issues, maybe you can leave out national security and all the really tough stuff, but most issues you can talk to people. He researched on this and found out that there is a general tendency of individuals to be anarchic and volatile to this suggestion. And the reason is something along the lines of, no, this will lead to some weird version of anarchy where people will decide different things on different days. There won't be, there won't be any stability going into the future. We need a stable government for four years to decide long-term policies. Kintu, if you really think about it, all this indicates is that human society doesn't really believe in democracy and are okay with throwing away autonomy. Because human society is okay with letting go of the ability to choose because they just believe that the outcomes matter more than the choice itself. So this is a thought experiment that is food for thought about how much we really value our autonomy or the collective autonomy of the human race. So all of this really suggests that there is no moral justification for democracy, right? Like, why else 
should we have it there it's just illegitimate it's taking away people's autonomy and if it takes away people's autonomy it has to have it's it's morally illegitimate right and then you just start thinking hmm why should we have this form of government the answer as always is utilitarianism this is because it still achieves better outcomes than all other systems of governments so this is a fun fact i learned from ashish's lecture um he basically mentioned that omorto sen said no functional democracy in the world has ever undergone widespread famine jaman hote when people decide what's good for themselves the worst kinds of harms are always stopped so it's maybe not morally legitimate but it's still a better way of organizing the world than other systems and that's why we still have it so that brings us to an end of the first section i think oh no there's some more stuff i forgot okay um wait if if utilitarianism is the metric we should be okay with benevolent autocracies as well right like benevolent manoche autocracies that are good like reminds you of a certain country or a justification of a certain prime minister um but the answer to this is probably maybe we should but that that most autocracies are just not benevolent and when they start being benevolent eventually they stop being benevolent in the long run and there are some very easy examples like muammar gaddafi erdogan robert mugambe we'll talk more about this in part 3 so that's basically the end of part 1 um i'll just have a bit of water before we start part 2 Cool. So what we will basically discuss in part 2 is if you remember what we concluded part 1 with it was that we justify the idea of democracies by saying that democracies are fine because they achieve good outcomes. But what we want to explore in this part of the lecture is do democracies really achieve good outcomes? what we will try to establish obviously they do achieve good outcomes you can argue this in a lot of ways and there are some really good ways of justifying the outcomes they achieve um in ashish's lecture you can refer to it uh, things like discourse um this and how they prevent the worst kinds of harms look into that but what the purpose of this lecture will be or this part of this lecture will be to show that most outcomes reached aren't really the best so there are two premises behind reaching good outcomes in democracies the first is individuals act in communal goodwill through rationality and consensus can be reached through discourse which is shobai ekshathe kotha bole shobai rational shobai chai shobar bhalo hok and eventually this leads to good outcomes the second premise is that institutions that ensure democracy like the separation of power act the legislative branch of government executive branch of government judicial branch of government um they all as check and balances they act as check and balances to each other and they ensure that good outcomes are reached fairly so jokhoni ekta politician churi chamari kore judiciary oder dhore jokhoni politician ra thik moto policies create na korte pare executive oder ke support dey through technocrats so it's all a process by which they create institutional check and balance against each other the first thing we'll talk about how have democratic institutions fail to protect the will of the people these institutions have failed number 1 the fundamental premise of all institutions is the constitution the constitution in most cases are outdated um they were made in periods that don't necessarily consider what the needs of today are so if you look at things like the american constitution that gave people the right to bear arms a lot of individuals believe that it was based on the context of um uh, 17th 18th century america at the time that the founding fathers had but the problem is if you want to make a constitutional amendment you need 75% or a super majority or 66.6% in certain countries um in parliament rarely does that happen because you don't want to support the opposing party by supporting their reforms so constitutions rarely change um they're often outdated and prehistoric and don't 
cater to the concerns of today. And the right to bear arms is one of the biggest um, constitutional amendments that have been tried for the longest time and have failed. The other part of why constitutions may be problematic is the people that write constitutions are often the majority who have control of the nation or the nation building process. So the constitution often doesn't include minority opinions. And um, from my understanding, the Malaysian constitution is built purely to protect the interests of the Malays and includes very little protection, maybe tokenistic protection of secular ideals for Indians and Chinese. But in a lot of literature, it is said that those protections don't get extended to the fullest extent because they're not fleshed out in the constitution as much. Um, the, second and mo the second reason why uh, institutions are failing is the way political parties are now working is they cater more to corporate interests rather than people's interests. So corporate lobby groups have systematically financed election campaigns in order to take up um, power once these politicians come into office. So this looks like oil companies who buy up politicians to stop environmental regulation. It looks like NRA who buys up politicians to stop gun reforms. It looks like the military industrial complex financing politicians to make sure that they go into wars and they're, like, they're able to sell weapons, they're able to hire private military contractors, etc., etc. A very interesting um, landmark, I think, Supreme Court decision in the United States was the Citizens United versus FEC, um, which basically was, I think it is in 2010, I'm not sure. Um, it was basically um, when the Supreme Court basically declared that it is not illegal for corporations to finance election campaigns. And it was written, money. It's now a precedent in the supreme in the legal system of the United States. So I don't want to get into too many details because we have a lot of things to talk about. But look into this and try to understand that corporate capture of politics is ruining institutional integrity in the sense that institutions cater more to corporate interests rather than to fairly check and balance each other or to protect the will of the people. The third is gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is basically designing states in order to make sure that minorities are always um, weaker off. So let's say that there are two constituencies, constituency A, constituency B. Constituency A te ponchashta voter, constituency B te ekshara voter. Let's say constituency A te shada manush ase chollish, constituency B te shada manush ase shait. Constituency A te kalo manush dosh, constituency B te kalo manush chollish. So shait chollish, chollish dosh. In both constituencies, White people are the majority, and they end up winning both constituencies. If these constituencies were redesigned, in order to make sure that Cholish are dosh, a ponchasta kalomanush ek state, ek shota shadamanush arik state, kalomanush ek state thakto, shadamanush ek state thakto, or a parliament eventually would be able to have representatives that fight off against each other. But the gerrymandering process, by the way, this is a spelling mistake. Um, it a G hor kotha, not J. The gerrymandering process basically uh, made constitu constituent divisions along lines that protect the majority. And most of the constituencies don't give swing power or democratic swing power, which basically means the ability to decide what happens within that constituency to the minorities. That's gerrymandering. That's another reason why institutions and the systems by which the system has been organized is failing. Fourth, winning coalition. This is a very interesting and very nuanced idea. Notice, you don't need a majority vote to gain power. Okay? So Bush versus Al Gore in 2000. Al Gore had the popular vote, Bush became president. Trump versus Hillary. Hillary had the popular vote, Trump became president. So. Let's not go into the details of the Electoral College. Rati Bharak, a fantastic lecturer on the Electoral College. Feel free to look into it for a detailed understanding of how this happens. But a very simplistic analogy to explain this is, say, um, let's say that there are 
10 constituencies okay 10 ta constituency prottekta 100 ta manush ase so total manush koto 1000 amar 10 ta constituency er moddhe 6 ta constituency jita lagbe to get 6 seats in parliament out of the 10 so i have majority seats prottekta constituency te amar 51 joner vote lagbe to win that constituency karon 100 ta manush 51 vote hoyle amar hobe so amar 51 into 6 votes lagbe out of 1000 to become the president of the country so all i need is 306 out of 1000 votes to gain power this 306 is my winning coalition so what this basically says is i don't even need to campaign to everyone ami jani je koyekta state amar protected new york is likely to vote democrat all the time texas is likely to vote republican all the time Amar J, J shop Jagai, a winning coalition ta established Koral Bay, a swing state Gulayami, election campaigns run Korbo, and other policies Ami cater Korbo. Baki Gulami Gababoina. So that's how the system itself only caters to the winning coalition, not to everyone. Fifth reason most countries have consolidated bipartisan power. So Aste Aste the political spectrum has shifted to the center and we no longer have many choices to begin with so bangladesh if you want to vote army leader bnp ke vote dite hobe to keo nai bjp ba congress ke vote dite hobe india te america te republican ba democrat ke vote dite hobe united kingdom labor ba tories either one of these have to get your vote maybe you can vote for the green party or the um, social democrats i think um, but who cares about them they're not going to win the election anyway so you never really register true consent because most people in Bangladesh don't really like Awami League or BNP, but we have to vote for one of them. So we vote for whatever we, is less harmful to us. So in most countries, bipartisan coalitions or two parties have consolidated power, right? And that exactly is why the will of people cannot really be fully expressed because it's an imperfect choice to begin with. The sixth reason is people currently don't get a lot of information because the states and organizations control information. So the first is the states often like keeping state secrets. So WikiLeaks the state The second and third reason I won't go into too many details because there's a social media lecture by Fardin Bhai that analyzes this in a lot of detail. But the media organizations and social media can often feed individual bubbles that prevents us from looking at the counter narrative so ami amar social media te jader ke amar algorithm diye cater kora ase ami hoyto onno opinion er manush ke exposure i pai na right so jar karone the way i make opinions is through controls of institutions that want to make me live in a bubble that benefits their choices so the control of information that exists is something that has made sure the institutions don't protect will of people to the fullest extent. Lastly, um, we won't talk about this in a lot of detail, but in the developing world, the separation of powers is increasingly being limited. Aste aste dekha jaye in certain countries, um, civil bureaucracy bhitre um, politician there manush tokenistic manush dukan hoche. Supreme Court er appointment gulao politician er decide kore. Legal system is shobai aste aste corrupt hoye jacche, shobai tokenistic party members hoye jacche. Um, university er bhitor ekhon nil shada ase. So it's a lot of institutional infiltration that has ruined the developing world in a lot of countries that removes the aura of institutional integrity from these places. That was the first part, which is institutions are not respecting the will of the people. Let's say these institutions are. Democracy can still end up leading to bad consequences if people behave irrationally, irrationally during voting. The first reason why people may behave irrational, irrationally is because of fear and insecurity. A lot of people are just afraid because things like economic cycles, losing jobs, going through recessions like the COVID crisis right now, have allowed the far right to take advantage of this and come to prominence. So individuals start blaming the establishment that they feel 
they trusted once and now because the establishment doesn't protect their interests and their votes or their um, benefits or their needs, uh, they feel cheated and start making irrational decisions. They also are likely to blame individuals that they themselves are insecure of because these individuals are alien. So they blame things like immigrants or individuals like refugees um, out of this fear and insecurity. The second is people are irrational because they're a victim of the establishment. They are fed false information. They live in their own bubbles. So one of the biggest reasons why Brexit happened, according to a lot of literature, is because the campaign process spread a lot of misinformation about what being in the European Union meant for the NHS or for Great Britain at large. So because you're a victim of this establishment, you make bad decisions to begin with. The third is even if you have access to information, in a lot of cases, people just have limited ability to process this information. This could be because we have non-uniform education levels. A lot of, say, complex economic decisions at a farmer in Mane Shatkira will not understand what those decisions should be. So education levels are high na hoy, decisions need to Manusha onik shomai cognitive biases thake. I mean details are China, but confirmation bias, proximity bias, anchoring bias, um, myopia, marketing myopia is a tool that marketing students will know about as well, but myopia basically means that inability to look into long distant issues and relying on short distant information. Look into these biases, I don't want to explain each of them in detail, but they're basically subconscious psychological biases that make you selectively pick information. So proximity bias means you selectively pick information of things that are close to you rather than things that are far away from you. So you are more likely to trust your parents and what they say rather than what a random person on TV says. Anchoring biases, acta jinish nye, you get fixated. So the fact that you see that a Muslim carried out terrorism is likely to be anchored in your head and you're unlikely to go past that despite other information being fed to you. Confirmation biases, because you have indoctrinated pre-existing biases, like the fact that you are indoctrinated to believe that LGBT individuals are really weird, non, mane, not normal people, because you're a religious person and you're indoctrinated to believe that, you will selectively pick information that confirms that and avoid information that contradicts that. So look into this, it's very interesting. It's psychological biases that you may look into. The third is, a lot of people are just emotional about their identity. So people get really emotional at the fact that their identity be is being taken away from them. So the Scottish referendum that happened, I think, in 2014 for independence from the British Union was based on the idea that the Belfast Agreement is not good enough to establish a unique Scottish identity. The, and I think this was re-established by Brexit because Scotland and Northern Ireland didn't really want to leave the European Union, but England did. So the fact that English identity is being imposed on Scotland is feeding into this emotion of their identity not mattering. Um, lastly, you just get a lot of pressure from peer groups to conform, conform to a lot of things. So um, the fact that a lot of my friends, I know a lot of people who are massive uh, supporters of the Awami League because um, their family members pressured them into believing certain parts of the identity of the political spectrum or because they believe that certain cult of personalities within the Awami League structure are more important than anything else. And honestly, if you think about it, Mane, when I, when I was growing up, I saw this. If you're a person who supports the Awami League in Bangladesh and you're also popular within your school, this adds a lot of peer pressure to people who want to fit in and people who want to be popular to start supporting that political identity as well. So they slowly start supporting the Awami League themselves, start supporting that identity and justifying that to themselves to get into that social group and get into that social privilege. And Jodi Manushtar Bakma Ba Khaladada MP Hoy to So a lot of peer pressure makes our ability to process rational information um, limited. Um, lastly it's just People behave irrationality, uh, irrationally when there's dynasty politics involved. And this especially appeals to older voters in aging populations. So if you're talking about cult of personalities from a long time ago, Bangladesh, you know, Ziaur Rahman ke diye BNP votes create kore, Aumi League, um, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, Tajuddin Ahmed, and all these people who had roles in the liberation war are used as emotional cult of personalities. It's not just people. You can also refer to events. So 
Bangladesher version of nationalism that is antithetical to Pakistan is based on the emotional event of 1971. So this is something that makes people irrational when voting for issues like foreign policy or being unruly in their actions. So a lot of this is based on this idea of dynasty politics and how institutions make people irrational. So if you notice a lot of these things are interconnected, um, the institutions sort of affect people as well. But it's important to understand the psyche of people when going through this entire thing. Let's say um, people are rational. They are engaged in proper, fair process of discourse. Even then, it is unlikely that people will protect communal interests over their own. This is because the, pe like, the institutions that have promoted democracy have also promoted free market capitalism or individualism. These are the United States primarily and Western societies that through the Cold War and beyond have pushed the idea of democracy down the throats of the global order. So they fed ideas like the American dream that breaks down ideals of communal interests that are embedded in socialism and communism and glorifying the idea of individual self-interest. So even in democracies where people are rational, because we glorify things like free market capitalism, the American dream, and all the things that come with democracy, people will operate in self-interest and aggregate self-interest means 51% of self-interest will never look after the 49%. So when you aggregate and collectivize self-interest, that never protects minorities as well. So even if the institutions are fair, even if people are engaged in proper discourse and rational, rationality will force them to be self-interested. There are more... Um, interesting literature into this. You can look into this. There's a justification for this based on game theory, where basically everyone uh, thinks that the dominant strategy is to be um, self-interested. I don't want to get into that. It involves math and understanding of game theory. But for those who want to look into it, look into game theory as well. What does this all mean? Is democracy really that bad? Because everything we just said says that democracy is really that bad. Presumably, that means that this shouldn't be a system that we can easily forego, right? Like, we shouldn't, sorry, this should be a system that we should easily forego. We should definitely find a better system because it really sounds like a terrible system that we live in. The answer is probably not necessarily because we need to understand from a theoretical perspective that despite democracy and all its flaws, all other systems of government are systematically a lot worse. And as long as we can prove that all other forms of government are a lot worse, albeit it be imperfect, democracy is still something we should adopt within our political spectrum. That brings us to the last part of this lecture, which is a theoretical approach to understanding dictatorships. Um, before we start this part, I'll just have another sip of water. Cool. So what we will try to understand in this part is not random case studies, but basically how democracies theoretically function. So on, on the offset, onset, offset, on the onset, sorry, ESL, um, on the onset, um, we're just going to leave some things out because obviously some pseudo autocracies are great, right? Because they ensure really good quality of life, like Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore or the current Singaporean administration. Some pseudo-autocracies are really terrible because they take control and treat people really terribly. So African dictators, Kim Jong-un, blah, blah, blah. What we will try to do is we will try to establish a theoretical claim for how democracies are likely to function rather than analyzing case studies of where they have functioned in particular ways. So Frederick Hayek, um, he claims that even if there are cases where some individuals end up being good while taking autocratic power, most dictators are individuals 
who have given up their life's work in order to exercise control over other individuals and concentrate decisions at the top. So this means they like having illegitimate power. They don't like having democratized power where they take the consent of people. They believe that they don't need others' inputs into the decision. And they believe that they have the best ability to make decisions themselves or trust one or two other individuals. So these are likely to be very egotistic individuals with a lot of self-confidence in who they are. And Frederick Hayek's claim is, these are the only people who are likely to become the leaders of nations in, in most autocratic governments. And these characteristics imply that these are the worst men or women in society. So it's best if we avoid autocracies because these are the groups of people that are likely to take power. What should we then understand? We should then understand how dictatorships function and keep hold of power despite being so oppressive. So this is the selectorate theory. It's a theory um, that's mentioned in a book called The Dictator's Handbook. Great book. You should read it. Um, it basically divides the country into four distinct groups of people. So I mean, democracy resembles the start query because Shamne quite the slide will talk about autocracies and how this applies to autocracies. Democracies, eh, there are four groups of people, right? The first is residents. Residents are all people living within a country, whether they are citizens of your country or not. So Bangladesh is the American citizen, they are a resident of Bangladesh as well. Bangladesh laws are follow followed, but they don't have direct ability to vote, right? So residents are all people, including non-citizens, who live within your borders. The nominal selectorate are people who have the tokenistic power to decide. So for example, the nominal selectorate in Bangladesh are, are individuals 18 years and above who have citizenship in Bangladesh. Shobar, in theory, act ability as it to vote for who becomes um, Mane, who becomes the prime minister or who becomes the rule, wh which party becomes the ruling party. The real selectorate is what we talked about in a previous slide. Eta hoche, those individuals who are actually going to exercise that power. So, shabari to onek voting power ase, real selectorate hoche, jara oi power to exercise kore, jara actually je vote de, actually rasta name. So Bangladesh into Shobar voting power thakleo sick I think last election Bish Tirish percent Manush gets a vote kurte. So real selectorate was the 30% of people. The other 70% despite having nominal power didn't exercise that power. So they don't really matter. They never decided who became the head of, or who became the Prime Minister, which party became the ruling um, party. The real select are selectorate are those that exercise the power. Lastly, the winning coalition. Winning coalition, like the previous slide, we see numbers. Diye, je real selectorate the bhitor eyo. Amar shobai ke kator kora lagbe na. Amar just protect the constituency majority diye majority constituency jitle. I have a winning coalition. So residents, nominal selectorate, real selectorate, winning coalition. This is obviously different for an autocracy. In an autocracy, shobar to shob shobai resident. Yes, nominal selectorate. Maybe Shobai, because on a autocracy, pseudo autocracy, but real selectorate actually could be come. Like um, real selectorates are basically in most oppressive autocracies: businessmen, oligarchs, military, etc., etc. We'll talk about that in the next slide. So, what exactly is the winning coalition, or what exactly is the winning coal, or or the real selectorate sort of for dictatorships? For dictatorships, they are the army which basically ensured that there's no military coup. And in case that someone protests against you, the army protects you. This is seen in countries like Myanmar, in Pakistan, et cetera, et cetera. Um, secondly, uh, it's business elites and oligarchs, businesses who fund you and keep you in power. Russia is a very good example. Third, it is the judiciary and the Supreme Court. So um, when there is limited separation of power, between the Supreme Court and the, judici uh, the judiciary or the Supreme Court and the state, 
that's when you can get your laws passed more quickly. That's when the Supreme Court protects you more strongly. The fourth is the civil bureaucracy. So civil bureaucracy ensures that civil bureaucracy, which is secretaries and ministries and people who work there, it ensures that all your policies are passed in the way you want them to be passed. The fifth is media. The media ensures that no misinformation is spread about you and no negative criticism is created for you. And international support. A lot of autocracies just survive by based on international support. So Bashar al-Assad, Venezuela, um, all of these places are protected by Russian and Chinese interests. So all of this reminds you of a certain country, doesn't it? Like I leave it as food for thought. But I'm not saying you need all of these six things to become an autocracy. You don't. These are groups that are part of the real selectorate. What you need to decide is what will be your winning coalition within them. Maybe you don't need all of these people on your side. Maybe you just need the military. Maybe you just need the judiciary and the media. Maybe you just need business elites. It depends from country to country, context to context. But the winning coalition for dictatorships will be decided from these groups of people. And all of these groups of people will make up the real selectorate within a dictatorship. So what exactly do you do to satisfy the winning coalition within a dictatorship? What you do is, when the winning coalition is small, such as in autocracies, you satisfy them with private goods. So, taka poisha, goods da, oder ke business interest da, oder ke desher taka churi korte da, oder ke nijer pocket er bhitor goods nite da. This was this happened in Brazil, um, where like the oil companies, this happened uh, were controlled by um, cronies of uh, the ruling uh, party in Brazil. This has happened in Russia. This happens in almost all major dictatorial countries, like China is a very good example for state-owned enterprises. I think I read a report, or I think it was a friend of mine, now it actually told me, um, that the wet market in China, which is the root cause or suspected root cause of the entire COVID crisis, has been, has been criticized within China for quite some time, but because there are business interests of people within the CCP, um, it's not removed. So you allow them to, gain private satisfaction through private goods. When the winning coalition is large, such as in democracies, the leader uses public goods to satisfy the coalition. So you build roads, you give education systems, healthcare, etc., etc. So that's a theoretical way of satisfying the winning coalition. So the dictator's handbook suggests the five following strategies to keep power, okay? And it's very interesting. It will give you a theoretical understanding of how a dictatorship maintains power. Number one. The smaller the winning coalition, the fewer the people to satisfy to remain in control. So keeping a winning coalition small makes your hold of power even stronger. Second, having a large nominal selectorate gives a pool of potential people to replace dissenters in coalition. So if you have a nominal selectorate that's large, right? So army officials say acta army official you can replace it. So it's very easy to have control if you have a large nominal selectorate that you can replace the dissenters within your winning coalition with. The third is you should maintain control of revenue flows and redistribute your friends in the winning coalition. So this could be tax revenue, this could be business flows, etc. etc. The fourth is only pay friends enough that they will not consider overthrowing you and at the same time little enough that they depend on you. So don't give them so much money that gives them so much power but also don't give them so little and don't continue to support you. Or lastly, don't take your friends' money and redistribute it to the masses. Continue to satisfy the businesses and continue to satisfy the oligarchs. So that was basically the thought process of this lecture. Um, it starts with the, what makes us human. The fundamental idea behind humanity is idea of autonomy. Then we talk about the moral evolution of the state, where the state is built on taking away autonomy. Then we look at the justification for democracy, which says that you can only take away autonomy if you give autonomy to that person. Then we looked at the different forms of democracy and how they're all morally illegitimate. Then we said, the only way to make them legitimate is if they have 
good outcomes that such like that don't make them morally legitimate, but still make them a preferable outcome based on the consequences they create or the utility they create. The next section of the lecture showed lots of nuanced analysis for why good outcomes are unlikely to be reached in democracies. Then we pose the question, if we don't reach good outcomes, should we not have democracies? The next question is, no, we should not sacrifice democracies unless the alternatives are better. So the last section of this lecture talked about how the alternatives or autocracies are a lot worse. So that is the basic fundamental takeaway from this lecture. You can look at these motions that I've listed down um, and try to build cases for government and opposition. And a lot of these, I think all of these motions have their core arguments covered implicitly within this lecture. So I won't go into building cases for each and every one of them. But if you've listened to this lecture, a shatta motion govern up cases at least at the basic fundamental idea. Um, is there a motion that you don't understand? Just let me read through. Um, this is fine. 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 Blind voting could be a word that you don't understand. Blind voting basically means you don't know who the person is that you're voting for. You just know that person's policies. So when you go to vote, uh, election cycle hobena, karo chehara dakhano hobena, just policies dao hobe, je e manush ta eda eda korte chai, and then you vote for policies, not people. So that's basically blind voting. Um, the rest of the motions should be fine. So uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, pause the video, list down these motions. Um, it's a good exercise to prepare, govern up cases for these motions. Um, so the concluding remark that I'd like to end this lecture with is, democracy is the worst form of government except for all others. This is something that Winston Churchill said, and it's something that is the basic essence of the lecture that we had. Um, thank you very much uh, for spending your time. I hope this lecture was useful. I hope you find use in this lecture in future debates, and even if you're not a regular debater and just thought process, I think it's a good lecture to engage in for you to be a better citizen and understand politics to a greater extent. Um, I know the situations are around the world and especially in Bangladesh are very uncertain. Uh, a lot of people even close to me are currently going through um, COVID in different circumstances. A lot of people have lost jobs. A lot of people have been victims of the health crisis. Um, so it's just my earnest request to stay safe. Um, take care of your loved ones and make sure that you do your best to help this crisis get solved. Um, thank you very much. I'm happy to reach out to anyone in need of help, either with the crisis or with understanding this lecture. Um, I've been told by some people I'm a bit intimidating to approach. I don't know why. Feel free to approach me or drop a message either on Facebook or uh, in the YouTube comment section. Um, thank you very much. See you around.